Good morning. Um, let me set up the, the uh, timer so that I, I won't exceed the uh, time limit uh, of the time given to me uh, uh, today. So, um, first of all, um, I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dizer and then, of course, uh, uh, Professor Pine, of, uh, a president of the uh, European Society for Transition Studies, for inviting me to attend uh, this seventh uh, Congress. And uh, I'm very, very uh, excited to uh, share some of the ideas uh, with you today. And this, today's talk is a part of ongoing uh, research in which I want to, to discuss uh, translation, starting with the representation of translation rather than translation itself. How we usually represent translation, event of translation, action of translation to ourselves. Uh, and then in this representation, a uh, central issue would become, uh, I uh, uh, use the term, uh, schema or schematism of translation, according to which a uh, variety of activities we uh, uh, generally call translations are schematically uh, uh, figured out. And then uh, uh, I would like to, to specificity, historical specificity of translation as we understand it today. But in fact, when you historically investigate, uh, translation covers a huge uh, variety of forms and, and, and practices. Uh, uh, and then kind of translation we understand today is very, very specific to uh, modern international world, which is very closely related to the modern formation of national language and, and then discipline of translation. So in this paper, I'm particularly interested to pursue the possibility of liberating translation from the view of translation organized around the image of communication, the communication of a written text from one language to another. Translation is not a task limited to the written word, of course, but a concept. It is a concept which grants us the possibility to examine a new social action in general. It may well offer some viewpoint that allows us to glimpse an invaluable gateway from which to enter into an inquiry into sociality itself. Nevertheless, traditional view of translation has elided the potent sociality that suffuses it through its collaboration with the substantialization of national and ethnic languages. It goes without saying the argument regarding translation that I offer here try to avoid a lapse into another systematic dichotomy of differentiality known as phonocentrism uh, of the written and the spoken. But this is not all. By text, I certainly do not imply the traditional view of the text which limits it to documents or books, nor do I adapt here the widely disseminated dichotomy between practical task of oral interpretation and translation of scriptures. Uh, philosophy, literature, uh, in uh, written uh, script. I simply do not accept distinction between interpretation and translation precisely because I want to examine the operation of trope, figure, image, and schema, which suffuses the situation of translation while simultaneously historicizing the traditional view of uh, translation. In studying translation, we must pay close attention not only to how trope operates, but also to how it malfunctions. That is, in order to devise shifts in theory of translation, we not only need a transformation of basic concepts, but also a 
recomposition of tropes and figurations we rely upon. We must pay attention to how we apprehend translation, reflect upon how we represent it, and what figures in images or schemata we employ to render it representable to ourselves. Today, the very presumption that a language has its inside and outside must be scrutinized, and we must call into question the assumed regime of translation according to which one language is represented spatially as external and exclusive to another language. I have referred to this regime of translation in which translation is represented through the strict distinction between interior and exterior of a language as the homolingual address. In my view, we must historicize this regime of translation while at the same time turning ourselves towards the thinking of translation as a heterolingual address. Homolingual address derives its legitimacy from the vision of modern international world. And this vision projects the world as a forum for a juxtaposition of the state sovereignties as well as reciprocal recognition of nation states. The international world and nation state mutually reinforce each other and form a system of complicity. In order to unravel this traditional view of translation and to recombine the trope of translation towards an elucidation of sociality beyond the imaginary of a nation state and ethnicity, let me start with the trope of translation as a filter, the most common way of uh, 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 imagining uh, translation. For this trope is most often appealed to in apprehending what one does in translation. In a sense, this is the most conventional and popular trope by means of which we represent to ourselves the representation of translation in general. Let us begin an analytic of translation by questioning the working of tropes by which we apprehend translation. Characteristically, the heading, translation as a filter, seems to set up the problem of translation as one of a trope. One is solicited to proceed in an analytic of translation whose subject matter is anticipated in the form of metaphor. Of course, translation <coughs> is a metaphor. And in this sense, translation is usually referred to as metaphor of metaphors. And here, uh, I am dealing with question of metaphor of the metaphor, again. What is implied in this way of treating it is not a confirmation that translation is a filter, but rather it suggests, but it does not state definitively, translation may be like a filter, just as many, actually, the vast majority of titles of treatise, stories, paintings, films, books, reports, and so forth, do not declare themselves as propositions. A heading is really a declaration. Most often, it is not no more than an intimation or solicitation for thought. This heading, translation as a filter, probably rings horror, since it contains few unexpected insights. At first glance, proposing a metaphorical relation between translation and filter seems understandable, but in fact, one quickly becomes beset by a nagging feeling of, feeling of incomprehension in conjoining translation and filter, there are too many indefinite elements that intervene between the two terms. And thus, the provisional judgment, translation is something like a filter, immediately renders this heading unacceptable. In what ways, or as a result of which aspects, 
can the term future serve as a trope for translation? Is it not the case that precisely because we utilize this term filter, we become incapable of moving beyond the restrictions it places on translation? It, may, it is my con contention that to gain an understanding of this type of metaphorical judgment, we cannot help admitting that we lack something urgent, that we need a more persuasive explanation. Nevertheless, this title anticipates a certain view of translation, the mode of being that the term filter describes, in fact, perfectly expresses this view. In a traditional view, translation is often grasped as if some already determined meaning passes through a barrier and thus the figure of the filter effectively corroborates this representation of translation. From such a viewpoint, the filter is a curtain or barrier permeated by a fluid element. Of course, the term filter describes something which allows only certain things to pass through it and thus it is only at the point where permeability and impermeability coexist that a certain blocking entity comes to acquire the characteristic of a filter. A filter is precisely a semi-permeable membrane. Permeability presumes the existence of an element which passes through it and within it, therefore, are flows and movements. A filter by blocking a flow which has certain directionality is put under pressure by this element. Thus, inspired by figure of translation as a filter, we might unfortunately imagine that translation is a situation that arises only when there are two types of things, something that pass, passes through and something that does not pass through. In this view of translation, coexistence of permeability and impermeability is presumed, and hence there must be a flow with directionality. Further, the filter indicates a site where there is a curtain or barrier as an obstacle. This is often imagined as a line that bisects a surface or as a surface which bisects a space. It is the basic materiality, uh, material property of a filter to be something that obstructs something that hinders movement, even if it is full of holes and permeable, and so th those things that cannot pass through it are gathered in the filter and held in stasis. As a result, impermeable objects that previously circulate freely are trapped at the side of the filter and prevented from slipping through to the opposite side. This is the trope that first emerges when we in intertwine the ter terms translation and filter. A crucial function of translation is frequently alluded to at the starting point this, this uh, uh, trope. From out of something mixed, filter selects, classifies that which is permeable and that which is not perm in, uh, uh, permeable. Differentiating what can and cannot pass through is precisely the act of filtration. The term filter always indicates this act of filtration. However, should we therefore consider translation as something that, like a filter, identifies and distinguishes the translatable from the untranslatable? Practically speaking, the function of filtration as a metaphorical connotation has often insinuated its way into the theory of translation. In other words, it is precisely here that we are encountering pitfalls of tropic statement, translation, it's something like a filter.
the discriminatory function of the filter is not limited solely to the classification of the permeable and impermeable. We cannot overlook the fact that it also differentiates into two distinct areas, a space which is presumably connected between this side and that side. It splits one contiguous space into two. This function of filtration is possible only at the point when it is unidirectional, when the filter operates as a threshold and only on the condition that upstream flow and downstream flow uh, uh, are not blended together. Through the exclusive parti parti partitioning of space, filter acquires another trope of discrimination, that is, border. The filter thus takes on the sense of national boundary or enclosure, that is, not only the partitioning, partitioning of space, but also partitioning of the surface. Just as a surface is a specific type of plane segment of space, filter is a spatial threshold, but national border is an exceptional example of a threshold in space. On the one hand, national border discriminates between those who can pass through and those who cannot. If every person can pass through, national border cannot exist. Further, national border is a site of the customs boundary, distinguishing between certain things that can pass through it and others that cannot. Nevertheless, on the other hand, the national border constitutes outer edge of territory inscribed with the limits of the sovereignty of the nation state. If you cross the border, sovereignty of the nation state, which operates on one side, becomes invalid on the other. In other words, enclosure is an apparatus that discriminates between those who can be allowed to enter and those who cannot, but at the same time marks the outer edge of the land as property. Thus, the figure of filter can be expanded to encompass the distinguishing of heterogeneous areas of a surface, the establishment of demarcation between interior and exterior on the, uh, on the land, and mapping of sovereignty and ownership, thereby governing the communication between areas. In, it is a question of law and the right related to this governing of the communication between different areas of sovereignty and ownership. Thus, in our examination of translation, filter acquires yet another tropic function. Translation serves as a boundary that distinguishes the space. Its role is introducing threshold into space. In bordering, I want to use, instead of a noun, uh, I want to use border as a, a verb, bordering, not in border, but in bordering, that is, the inscription of border, that is to say, translation inscribes the border. It is not particular, particularly difficult to discern to how various characteristics of languages are being appropriated within this tropical economy. A boundary of articulatory paradigms and gener generative rules such as regularities of phonetics, morphology, and syntax are seen as a special characteristic of a given language. They are often thought of as archetypical examples of those things that do not typically pass through the filter. And can we not say that uh, a paradigm by which an enunciated voice is articulated into phonemes, the generative rules of comprehension and composition, and criteria which combine words, and indeed system of classification that distinguish words as morphologically significant units express the particularities of a given language, and constitute precisely typical example of what is erased by translation. Or may, maybe we should put it another way. 
To transmit a text into another language is to erase particular characteristics of original language and the filter as a translation manifests itself through the erasure of grammatical traits of a particular language. The conception of translation according to the model of communication finds its raison d'etre precisely in the economy of the trope that I have roughly sketched out here. This is to say, model of communication cannot be maintained unless transmitted content and rules of communication can be clearly separated. Transmitted content is generally seen as information. Throughout the latter half of the 20th century, term information has swept through the fields of economics, cognitive sciences, engineering, biology, and so forth, but it is overshadowed by the question of communication. Information indicates a knowledge transferred by means of an act of informing. In other words, it is that which one is informed of. To inform is to advise, to teach, by giving form and shape to the spirit of the other, and the information that is thus communicated has the characteristics of a message handed over by a messenger. Whether or not institutions and technologies develop from a paper letter carried by the courier to the postal service managed by national state, or from cabled telegram to international wireless internet, the theory of communication is incapable of shedding its reliance on the schema of message handed over by a messenger. In its original Latin etymology, communication is a word which links the senses of common to indicate community-held land, commons, communion, indicating spiritual interchange and fusion of souls, and community, as well as communism or communalism. Thus, communication as a way of thinking implies the specific mode of being of a community. But, as has already been extensively pointed out, this notion of community, conceived of by the mode of communication, contains within it numerous political dangers. In the mode of communication, transfer of information is understood parallel to the metaphor of the message, messenger who communicates a message from addressee to, uh, sorry, addresser to addressee. Generally speaking, however, this point is not understood even in arguments that attempt to uh, attempt a scholarly classification of uh, translation, such as uh, Roman uh, Jacobson's uh, famous formula about the, the uh, types of translation. The apprehension of translation according to the model of communication conceives of translation as a specific example of this type of general communication. The textual reading strategy known as deconstruction has already demonstrated in detail the impossibility of maintaining string, strict separation between the communicated content and rules of of, of communication, that is, uh, message and code. Nevertheless, let us proceed for a while as if this separation were unproblematically possible. For the sake of analyzing the, 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 the configuration of, of, of translation, let us attempt to graft the trope of translation as a filter onto the trope of the message communicated by messenger from addressee, uh, addresser to addressee. Then we will realize that what is filtered by this filter is first and foremost rules of communication. In the apprehension of translation through communication, what cannot pass through the filter is first identified as a particular grammatical qualities of a language, well, in, in, in by grammar, I uh, include phonetics, syntax, morphology, and so forth. Here, we must touch briefly on one result brought about the distinction between content and rule in this understanding of translation. <laughs> 
When content is translated from one language to another, this content contains elements that do not necessarily follow the rules of a particular language, for instance, uh, proper nouns. It is generally accepted that proper noun is not translated, nor is there any need to do so when strictly following the code of the target language. Aside from such an uh, exception, translation is expected to be an all-encompassing transformation of rules. When content in the source language is translated into content in the target language, rules of the source of source language should presumably be completely erased from the content expressed in the target language. Translation convey, con conveys content to us but does not teach us the grammar of a different language. Thus, by seeking the distinction between the translatable and untranslatable solely within the communicated content, the communication of rules is foreclosed from the outset, separated by the mutual exclusion between content and rule in this tropic economy. I'm not saying this strictly applies to, to translation in general. There are many, many historical cases in which this uh, a type of erasure of grammaticality of the source language are preserved. It's there, a, a huge number of examples of this type, but this is not a model in the modern international world. So which means modern international world invented very strict, very, very narrow view of translation. Because the grammatical rules or particular qualities related to organization of language are excluded from things that can pass through the future, the materiality of the text can never be examined as something translatable and is thus neglected. Consequently, distinction between translatable and untranslatable is anticipated only on the level of communicated content. That is, according to the model of communication, the untranslatable is determined from the start as something in the content of communication. In short, the untranslatable is only anticipated as the message that does not arrive. Furthermore, we can also associate this tro tropic economy with a typical argument on subjectivity. A person organizes things in the world through a certain system of categories. It is not easy to objectify the system of cognitive categories as a whole, but it may appear comparatively simple to identify it in terms of differences between one language and another. The confinement to one's so-called native language may well explain the confinement of one's subjectivity to one's native culture. For the time being, let me overlook the contradictions inherent in this argument since I will examine them later. We can see most starkly the contra uh, conspiration, uh, conspiratory lateral linkages between the mode of communication and culturalism precisely in the discussions of subjectivity that are bound up with translation in the representation of language. Here too, the trope of the future exhibits a new force. We are born with a given language and acquire the ability to recognize the world with the grammatical rules of this native language. It should then follow that well before we produce words, before we gain a knowledge of other languages, our cognitive capacity should be determined in its scope through the table of already given cognitive categories. And the trope of a filter steps in. We should be able to cognize the world only through a given filter. In this way, 
discussions of subjectivity jump too quickly to conclusions by way of spatialized trope of a language, a spatialized figure with a clear contour. I have no intention here to reduce in discussion of transcendental criticism that emerged in the 18th century to the problem of culturalism, but the trope of translation as a filter clearly exposes symbiotic relation between discussions of subjectivity and anthropological culturalism, such as that inspired by American structural linguistics put forth by uh, people like Edward Sapir and uh, Benjamin Wolfe. That's a most popular type of culturalism. The filter which distinguishes the permeable from impermeable enables representation of two different spaces, but that is not all. It also forms these into two spaces saturated by differing system of grammatical rules, rules that are organized by means of phonetic syntax and so forth. Here, different space carries a connotation of different language language which is assumed to be a potential system of rules is given a specialized figure as if it were a closed area. If individual enter the world burdened by their language of birth or their native language, they would have been born already located in one of these specific spatial areas to the extent that they depend on the trope of translation as a filter. In other words, area distinguished by translation becomes a space that expresses a primordial belonging symbolizing the destiny of the individual. The space is imagined as a destiny of one's cognitive capacity, which cannot be changed by individuals' own initiative as an innate trait of ability or inability from birth, like color blindedness. I experience, well, th this culturalism would argue, I experience the things of the world through a certain system of category, categories. So, in principle, I have no access to a position from which to judge the relevance or irrelevance of my experiences as a whole. There is no way for me to judge in advance whether or not the world I am given is biased or distorted. I might see the world through a colored lens, but this lens is nothing but the lens that goes by the name of native language. Regardless of whether my retina of the eye receives light through a colored lens or not, I have no direct access to an unbiased perspective that could correct my own prejudice towards the world that embrace in perception. Biased or not, prejudiced or not, the world I perceive is nothing but my world, the world of my immediacy. One reason that this phrase, translation as a filter, has a certain persuasive power is that it prepares us for the deployment of a trope, which makes it possible to mobilize translation within this type of argument on subjectivity. At the same time, let us not overlook the following point. By inciting us to construe the representation of translation in terms of trophic figures of upstream and downstream flows of the filter, or two spaces separated by a barrier, translation as a filter enables us to figure language as an enclosed space circumscribed by boundaries. This is to say, the trope serves as a schema for the spatial figuration of language. It has long been known 
the solipistic subjectivism, which asserts its own limits in terms of nativism of cognitive capacity, cannot avoid certain inner contradictions. In order to show that we are predetermined to perceive the world through a filter, we must postulate experience of seeing without this filter, as if we could see without the colored lens. If the filter is an innate condition of our perception, how can we possibly assume a situation in which it would be possible to cognize something without this filter? We should pay close attention to this site, wherein the topic of the trope starts slides away. And this is the, one of the, the examples that tropic of, 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 of translation as a filter contains. It's a, a malfunctioning a, a, a factor, inevitably. Translation, insofar as it is a filter of permeability, dissects space into two segments, but whether or not these separated spaces are necessary form as an enclosure has not yet been problematized, because the translation as a filter uh, shows that if it's a filter and, 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 and so, so the moving flow exists, then it clearly separates space uh, into two, yet it does not mean that the spaces thus separated are on unit or enclosed. While the trope of filter as a lens always creates certain interiority so that the world is imagined to consist of juxtaposed interiorities. Usually we use the term culture, trope of culture, and then, for instance, we constantly use term, terms such as interculture or transcultural. Always implies this uh, figuration of the world yeah, in which the, you have a space already enclosed. Each one is enclosed so that each space can be juxtaposed to another. These two are, in fact, two entirely different typo uh, uh, topologies. We must keep in mind that these are two different to topologies. So we should pay close attention to this site where tropic trope starts to slide away. Translation, insofar as it is a filter of permeability, dissects space into two segments, but whether or not these separated spaces are necessarily formed as an enclosure has not yet been problematized. For now, however, Filter does not merely divide continuous space into two. It implies an overarching condition that restricts one's capacity mm -hmm. to cognize the external world like a photographic lens that selectively transmits light coming into a camera obscura. Here, it is as if this filter, as a, uh, sorry, a translation as a filter has come to possess the character of an optical filter that converts main lens of a camera rather than form of a filter as semi-permeable membrane. Yet, curiously enough, although the figure of the filter is called for to express innateness of cognitive character in terms of uh, spatial allocation, it becomes a principle by which to explain how cognition takes place prior to translation. Knowledge, acquires, uh, knowledge acquired a posteriori by means of translation is postulated to explain the apparent existence of innate capacity a priori to translation. You can see it's a very strange logical uh, 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 mistake is constantly committed in uh, uh, culturalism. Here we see the contradictions in the procedure of argumentation that I mentioned earlier. In order to gain an awareness of constraints imminent in the cognitive capacity in one's native language, 
one must have the experience of othering or being othered in relation to a foreign language. And consequently, those who can neither speak nor read a foreign language, in theory, should not even be capable of being aware of the constraints imposed upon them by the native language. Without the incomprehensible, or without an encounter with foreigner whom one does not comprehend, one cannot become aware of the limitation of one's own cognitive capacity. Translation falls over upon itself and gives rise to the moment of what may be well called reflection. However, the reflection into native language has a fundamentally different temporality from that of transcendental reflection, and we should not confuse these two. It is still worth keeping in mind that translation provides a negative moment in relation to the neg uh, native language, and that without the presumption of foreign language, of an encounter with strangers or estrangement through the foreign, awareness of something as native language should be impossible from the outset. Therefore, nativism that posits native language as an innate condition for one's cognitive and practical capacity become possible only in passing through a moment of negativity in relation to native language itself. As long as our argument is dictated by tropic economy of translation as filter, can we not evade the conclusion that consciousness of one's native language would never be possible without translation as a mediation? Even though it is not openly doubted that native language could ever exist in and of itself. This is precisely the structure of modern world. That is to say, structure of modern world provided translation as a result of which one's national linguistic identity became possible. Thus, pitfalls of tropic or filter have been laid out or laid bare. As a trope switches from the filter as a same permeable membrane to the filter as a photographic lens, just as a topic in the Aristotelian sense of topos, the place of subject matter slides away in the shift from the filter as a membrane to optic filter in the tropic of translation as a filter. So the spatial configuration assumed by, by the trope changes. A new topological transformation is involved in this shift. A shift occurs in the spatial configuration pertinent to each of the tropes of the filter. From the binary segmentation between the spaces of upstream and downstream flows, separated by thin membrane, to the relation of one and the many between native language and many foreign languages. The filter of permeability divides two spaces, but properties of each are determined in relation to other uh, 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 space. Each space is determined relatively and depending upon the other space it is paired with. Whether or not each of spaces thus separated is enclosed or circumscribed is not determined. However, as soon as strobe of filter acquires the character of an optical filter, the determination of space's property is altered. It is no longer relative. It acquires certain autonomy and becomes unity in juxtaposition with other units. Each of the spaces separated off from each other by the filter come to be represented as if they already possess these properties as inherently determined, just as in many cases of culturalism. We tend to think that each uh, culture has its internal, innate uh, uh, property. 
and then uh, each culture predetermines the, the uh, individual's the capacity to perceive things and, 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 and not, not to mention uh, 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 a capacity to enunciate or speak. Each species uh, is represented as if it were predetermined in its properties irrespective of other space from which it is differentiated. Thus, well, then we will be unable to pay attention to the very unity of the space that arises only when the threshold divides it from other spaces. It is usually forgotten that translation is first and foremost expressed in the verb to translate, and that translation is an event an action. This is analogous to the way in which people forget the national border is not a natural condition, that it is an institution created through the acts of sovereignty by the state, the ruler, national people, and so forth. In precisely the same sense, uh, uh, we must not ignore the fact that border itself cannot exist in separation from the act of uh, bordering. They, in this sense, you can now gradually see translation is an act of bordering par excellence. That is to say, border or separation between two languages, in fact, cannot exist prior to translation. Rather, translation institutes this separation and so forth. And now you can see why translation, transformation of the regime of trans, I, I, I call regime of trans, certain institutionalized protocols of translation drastically changed in, I think in Europe, mainly in 18th century. And then that's how I think the disciplines of humanities were clearly instituted around the, 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 the uh, uh, practice of uh, translation. Likewise, in Eastern Asia, uh, 18th century and 19th century, drastic transformation of translation began. In, as a matter of fact, prior to 18th century, the classical texts did not get translated, or uh, they applied all sorts of methods, but <coughs> from a viewpoint, they were hardly translation. Um, so um, this is how I think the uh, gradually uh, national language came e into existence. And talking about national and ethnic languages, it is absolutely necessary to uh, 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 talk about translation. And not merely a translation uh, uh, as an act, but how translation was represented. The figuration of translation played an essential role in the, the uh, representation of international world. So um, I, uh, uh, let me see. Yes, uh, it's nearly the end of the, uh, uh, well, the, the time given to me. So um, briefly, I, I touched upon the question of very, very good uh, uh, a book by uh, a scholar on, on, on Thailand. It's called uh, Siam Mapped, in which he really showed the formation of uh, territory of Thailand, because a uh, 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 Thai uh, regime in the 19th century did not have uh, a national border. So it was not territorial state. Hence, the, uh, uh, well, then uh, uh, the, the kingdom was called Siam. Siam uh, could not be included in the system of international law because it was not a uh, uh, territorial uh, uh, national state sovereignty. Hence, in that process, they adopted both from the pressure from, from French and, and British, both were uh, invading Southeast Asia at that time, then gradually uh, Thailand adopted cartographic technology, according to which, for the first time, they began to imagine 
the territory of Thailand. And then uh, um, author uh, uh, Tong Chai Winchaku called this figuration of, of uh, national territory geobody. And only through the formation of geobody, it turned into a modern national territorial state sovereignty. Thereby, they could <laughs> accommodate, uh, yes, uh, accommodate the demands of British and, 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 and French, but at the same time, then it uh, turned uh, uh, itself into a, a modern nation state in uh, uh, international world. This process of cartographic representation is precisely the form <coughs> according to which many uh, countries in, in Asia invented their own national languages. And then most important factor up, uh, uh, in, in this process was of course a translation. Therefore in most countries uh, in the 19, late 19th and early 20th century uh, the uh, radical redefinition of translation occurred and together with radical de redefinition of translation uh, they emerged their own national language uh, for the first time thank you very much Thank you very much, Naoki, for this very inspiring speech. Uh, uh, we, maybe we have time for one or two questions or comments. We are almost in the coffee break, but we have the coffee break. <laughs> yes, please. Thank you very much for your interesting uh, schema, topic, whatever. Um, let me see if I understood you correctly. There is a continuum, and there is translation. Yes. Serving as a filter, dividing up the continuum, the continuum into two parts. And yes, that is information and communication. So, in other words, translation constitutes, as you said, um, institutes separation is an act of bordering par excellence. Mm -hmm. Now, my question is, what happened before translation was posed there as a filter? What about communication and information in that situation? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, thank you very much. Uh, um, one of the reasons why I didn't want to start with translation itself, rather I wanted to start with representation of translation is translation always involves the question of discontinuity. Discontinuity, in a sense, uh, uh, means essentially the, the, uh, you encounter somebody and then you cannot understand. You are at a loss. Hence, you cannot figure out what he or she wants to say or what he or she wants to do. Hence, it, you cannot talk about the very experience of nonsense, precisely because that incident, or you, you may uh, not be able to call it incident, has no sense. Translation is essentially sense-making operation, in this sense. Therefore, it is impossible to generalize and when you want to generalize, you cannot talk about translation as a creation of sense-making uh, mechan mechanism. Instead, you have to retreat back to the question how you, you usually represent translation to yourself. That is, that's why I call it schema, essentially. Schematism. Uh, a schema, for instance, in the Kantian sense, is that, yes, uh, Kant talked about time. You don't know how to, to explain about time. And when you encounter something you cannot uh, uh, understand, you need schema, uh, 
some kind of figure. By applying that figure, you assume it is comprehensible, and on that basis, you start discussing time. Therefore, uh, for Kant, schema of time is, in fact, the essential, precisely because you don't know what time is. Likewise, we encounter this uh, similar situation in translation. Translation, in its radical implication, it is precisely discontinuity. Discontinuity is uh, uh, nonsense. You are at a loss. When you are at a loss, you cannot explain what you are, are doing. So I really want to respect that, um, um, uh, um, that uh, uh, element of, of nonsense or uh, element of uh, uh, radical uh, incomprehensibility. We do encounter uh, instances of incomprehensibility in, in, in our life. And translation is our effort to deal with the, these incomprehensible uh, uh, incidents. But it is uh, impossible to generalize it. If there are no other questions or comments, we might have also the possibility to talk to uh, <laughs> Professor Sakai during the break now, and then we'll continue at 11.30 with the session. But I want to thank you again now okay. for coming and for this wonderful Well, thank you very much. Thank you.